right. Hello. Happy Wednesday. Uh, appears that winter might not be done with us just yet. Uh, is there a prefect session tonight? Yes, a prefect session from 8.30 to 9.30. Um, yeah, come for questions so that we can see. Um, I get to do that. Right. Um, and there'll be really good cookies there because uh, the prefect office are like a new shipment of really fancy, fancy cookies. To come, you know? Yeah, that's it. All right. Any questions on the lab or any of the graph stuff to get us started? Jeffrey. Yeah, I have a question on the stop line. So, if K tree is really efficient, is this one time more cost per second than the yeah, so Jeffrey asks about the challenges that ask you to, to time the number of uh, calls that your KD tree can do per second. And so as each call gets faster, then you can do more per second. So when you're kind of measuring how many happen over 10 seconds, kind of the, the higher the better. Does that make sense? Other questions? Charlie? Uh, so I can help take a look at that out of, uh, after class. Um, I think that it, my guess is it's based on what kind of exactly you have, how you have opened VS Code, it can be not very helpful about finding files. Uh, other questions? All right, so you may have seen that uh, there's uh, this week's quiz is up on, on Moodle. We're back to uh, a Moodle quiz, no, no coding and, and grade scope uh, this week. So, uh, quiz will will uh, cover heaps and then some of the the graph stuff that we have been talking about and we'll talk about today, uh, and that will be due 9 p.m. on Friday. And lab our final lab lab seven, uh, which is uh, about implementing a graph algorithm, has been posted. Uh, the check and post will be due next Tuesday, uh, with the lab due uh, a week from Friday. I have been told I am not able to offer any extensions past the last day of class. So lab seven, you will not be able to use any late days. That must be turned in uh, 9 p.m. Friday, March 11th. Okay, so let's start out uh, remembering what we were talking about last time, which was our topological sort. So I have a, uh, what what was the kind of graph that we could do a, a topological sort on? Anyone remember? Liam? A DAG. Uh, a DAG, and, and what does DAG stand for? Serving? A directed acyclic graph. A directed acyclic graph. So we have directed arrows, we don't have any cycles, uh, so we can do our, our topological sort. So I'm asking you to identify which of those four kind of outputs, those orderings of, uh, of our nodes, uh, would not be a valid topological sort. Uh, large move toward D, that's great. This is the one that won't be a topological sort. Uh, can someone explain how you thought about uh, Identifying the, the invalid one. Jake? I guess if you look, consider the order of it, it would have to start with uh, a node with nothing going into it, and then uh, it would like process all the subsequent arrows from that. So specifically, you go through D, you go through zero, and then two and three zeros. And then 
one it's not, but I guess one's at like the uh, at also the level of zero where there's nothing coming into it, but then how would you get from one to four? So there's some sort of disconnect there because four would have to come from I guess either two or three. We've already processed that, so it should be right after. Um yeah, the, the, the order of three and, and one here is the the key thing because this topological sort says that we can't output a node if there's some other node that has an edge into it that we haven't output yet. Which means that before three shows up, both the nodes that go into it, zero and one, would need to be to be in the output. Uh, and we can see that in the other three answers, zero and one show up before three, but they're out of three and one are out of order in answer D. Um, what are your questions on that? Does that make sense? All right. So let's get back to our analysis of topological sort and we had an algorithm where we started out labeling each vertex with its in degree how many edges are coming into it uh, and then just went through uh, our, our vert vertexes and got one that had no edges coming into it one with degree zero put it in the output and then process the edges of the node that we just sort of conceptually removed from our graph and kind of subtracted that degree uh, from the other, uh, from its neighbors. And we analyzed this in terms of, kind of what, how much work would this initialization, this label each vertex with its in degree take. We'd have to go through each vertex to give it a label and then to give it a label that is the number of edges coming into it, we would also have to kind of count all the edges at some point. So our initialization was size of V plus size of E. I said finding this next vertex was going to be just looping through all the vertexes remaining and finding one with degree zero. And in the worst case, Maybe it's kind of the last one we check every time. So every time we do this find a new vertex, we end up checking every single remaining vertex. And we do that operation kind of once for each vertex in our, in our graph, once for each time around this loop. And if this is also kind of linear time uh, together, that gives us our big O of V squared. And then in terms of this inner for loop that was subtracting from the in degree, uh, the trick here is that we're processing uh, an edge in order to subtract one from this in degree, and we'll only do that at most, we'll only do that once for each edge in the graph. And so if we kind of add up all the times that we subtract one from a degree it will just be the number of edges or big O of size of E. And does anyone remember why when we sort of add these all up to get the total, we had it as big O of V squared? Like why does the initialization or like why does the size of E uh, not show up? In? If you go to infinity, the only like curve that really matters is the e squared. Uh, how do we know that size of e isn't bigger than v squared? Peter? Because there's a maximum number of edges you can have between vertices as long as you're not like having multiple of the same. Yeah, exactly. That's why we talked about the maximum number of edges we could have in a graph. Uh, because we, it's, it was very useful to have sort of an upper bound on the total number of edges. And, or undirected 
are uh, our number of edges uh, went up to something like kind of size of v times size of v plus one over two um, and we said, well, that's going to be big O of V squared. If we kind of put this expression in, in big O terms and our directed graph was similar in terms of if we just put in the maximum number of edges, we saw it was size of V squared, if we allowed the kind of self edges in our graph. And this means that whenever we see size of E, sort of the biggest it could possibly be is big O of V squared. Just we couldn't have, if we have V size of V nodes, we have this upper limit on the number of edges. Uh, so when we turn these size of E into kind of our worst case size of V squared, then we have V plus size of V squared plus size of V squared plus size of V squared all gets us to size of V squared. Does that make sense? So then I asked, is this good? Is this bad? Our, if our algorithm is size of V squared, um, how, do we, how do we judge that? So in this case, it's going to depend on what kind of graph we actually have. For example, uh, if I have size of V nodes, some number of nodes, and this graph is connected, meaning that I can kind of uh, have a path between any two, any two pairs of nodes. What is the minimum number of edges I would need in order to make this graph that I've drawn up here connected? Uh, how, how do you get the, the what, what th three edges? Yeah, we're kind of drawing them in here, and we have some number of nodes in between here, and they come here. So if we were to put this in terms of, like I had four circles up here, and so if I would put this in size of V, what would it be? V minus one. Exactly. For our kind of connected, undirected graph, I need at least size of V minus one edges. But this brings up uh, the key idea here, which is that the number of edges in this connected graph is nowhere near the maximum number of edges that we would have, right? Our minimum number of edges is like a factor of V less. Like it's linear instead of quadratic in terms of the number of edges. So whether an overall efficiency of size of V squared is good or bad depends on are we dealing with a graph that only has a few edges or are we, are we dealing with a graph that has a lot of edges? So to put this, uh, to put some actual terminology to this, we say that a, a dense graph is one where this the number of edges is kind of approximately like close to the maximum number of edges like the size of edges is about the size of v squared and we say that a sparse graph is one where the number of edges is more like our kind of minimum connected case over here, or the, the number of edges is closer to just the number of, of nodes.
And so when we're thinking about algorithms on graphs, whether we're dealing with a dense graph or a sparse graph, they matter a lot. Because if we're doing something for each edge, then, um, then it really matters whether we're doing kind of v squared or, or size of v. Questions on that? So if we're dealing with a sparse graph, then our initialization and our sum of all decrements are more like size of v. And it's really this finding the kind of new vertex with degree 0 that is uh, a real pain. That is kind of the slow part of our, of our algorithm. And so we can do... Uh, we can do better than just kind of finding a zero degree node, kind of assuming that we don't know anything about which nodes might be zero degree. Uh, does anyone see a point in this algorithm where we would have the opportunity to tell that a node has become a zero degree node? Peter? When you subtract um, an in degree from a node, it would probably be pretty easy to tell if it's zero degree at that point. Exactly. That we, we start off with initially labeling everything. So we know what the zero degree nodes are at the start. But then every time we subtract a degree, we could just check is this node now zero degree? So we have a way to identify like when nodes become a zero degree. Uh, and so, given that, what we want is, say, a Q to just keep track of the zero degree nodes that we've seen so far. And so our algorithm becomes, first we're going to label all nodes with their degree, and whichever ones are zero, we'll put in our Q. And then every time around our, our loop, will just remove one of these zero degree nodes from the queue. And then when we subtract from the degree, as Peter suggested, we'll just check. Is the degree now zero? And if it is, put it into our queue. If we're, if we want a data structure that has kind of a first in, first out behavior uh, and would give us constant time uh, like adding to one end, removing from another. Anyone have a suggestion for what we could use for, for our queue in this, in this pseudocode? Luke? Just a linked list. Right? Yeah, a linked list would be, would be perfect here. A linked list would take us from our... Uh, or uh, a V, uh, take us from kind of this step of finding the next zero degree node from taking linear time to being constant. We just remove one thing from the front of a linked list. And so if we redo our analysis of this code, our initialization and subtracting one from the degree for all our neighbors, those have stayed the same, but now, Every time around this loop, we do a constant time like remove from the queue and maybe add some things to the queue. And so all together, like constant time inside the loop, the loop goes around size of V times. We add that all up and we get big O size of V. Does that make sense? And so by including this uh, queue, in our algorithm, our, our running time becomes big O size of V plus size of E. And of this, this in, initialization step is actually the, now the most, uh, the most expensive step. And for our dense graph, this is not particularly an improvement in big O terms. Uh, 
because size of E is size of E squared. But for our sparse graph, this is a huge improvement. We've gone from V squared down to, to big O V. What are your questions on that? All right. So there's a couple other algorithms that I would like to, to talk about that we can use on graphs. And topological sort has been and if we want to take some directed acyclic graph and kind of put the nodes in some order, say it's course prerequisite, such that every course appears after all of its prerequisites in our, in our output. So what we're going to be trying to do now is to search a graph or we can also think of this as traverse a graph. So we've uh, um, oftentimes uh, uh, when we're dealing with, with trees, we've wanted to search or traverse them, go through the nodes in the tree in some particular order. So I were to, to kind of write some pseudocode for a traverse graph function. It's going to start at some node. And I'm going to keep track of some kind of list or, or set of things that I'll, call, that I'll call pending. These are the nodes that we're going to traverse next. And I guess I'll start that out including the, the, start, the start node. And we're also going to have this idea of, let's imagine a Boolean that's at each node that is keeping track of whether our search has visited that node so far. So we're going to mark start as visited, uh, and all the other nodes in our graph will be unvisited to begin with. And then I'll just say while... While the sort of my my list of nodes that I am going to visit next is not empty, I'll remove the next node from my from my list. And then I will kind of process the neighbors of the node that I just removed. And what this will mean is I'll give the neighbors a name. So each neighbor u of next. So I can say if u is not marked. I'll mark you as visited and then add it to the nodes that I will go through next. And you can think that if 
we were wanting to print out the nodes in our graph uh, at the same time that we mark a node is also when we might print it out. Or if each node in our graph um, has some data associated with it, uh, maybe, um, uh, maybe our, our graph has our kind of nodes are, uh, uh, we have some, some map where the nodes are our cities and we want to kind of go through all the, the nodes and add up the population of all the cities. And so kind of when we mark something is also when we would kind of do something with the data at that node, like add the city's population to, to the total that we're keeping track of. And so assuming that removing from our list of pending nodes and adding to our list of pending nodes, uh, assuming that that is a constant time operation, that we choose a data structure uh, that, that, that will let us do that, uh, like in when we're analyzing topological sort, we have a loop that's going to go through each node one time. And then we have another loop that's going to kind of go through each edge in our graph one time. Uh, and if we go through each node once and each edge once, what would our kind of big O running time be? Right. Uh, exactly. Each node once, each edge once gives us number of nodes plus number of edges. So the uh, does this make sense? Questions on this? So the order in which we're going to visit our nodes is just going to depend on what data structure we choose to hold the pending nodes. And there are kind of two, two big ideas in computer science uh, related to this kind of search. If if pending is a stack, so if we're, we're kind of pushing nodes onto the stack and then popping them off, uh, this is going to give us an algorithm called depth first search. And we can think of this and we'll see examples of depth first search as sort of um, recursively exploring one part of the graph or kind of going deep into one part of the graph before coming back and exploring others. If our penny is instead a queue, something with first out, first in behavior, we get something called breadth first search. Uh, these often go by the algorithms DFS or BFS, and kind of our breadth first search is going to be exploring gradually kind of farther and farther away from the start rather than kind of going deep in one part, coming back and deep in another. So uh, I will go through, I want to go through some examples that will kind of show what uh, our breadth first search and depth first search uh, would look like on different graphs. Uh, but first, I want to tell you about President Herbert Hoover, 31st President of the United States. And uh, Republicans had been uh, presidents through all the 1920s. Uh, times were pretty good. Uh, Hoover had uh, a, great, a great reputation. Um, and so d despite the fact that he had never held any elected office, 
not one, uh, prior to 1928, he was elected president. Um, and he was elected president resoundingly. And so he had kind of uh, cultivated this, this great reputation. Um, one, one part of it was during the First World War, uh, due to uh, the German occupation of Belgium and the British naval blockade, uh, Belgium, which had before the war imported most of its food, was not able to import any food, um, nor were, uh, was the German government willing to send food to Belgium. And so people were worried that millions of people were going to starve uh, during the war. And Hoover, a big believer in kind of private individuals stepping up and cooperating, uh, organized this Im immense international relief effort. Like there, this private effort had its own fleet of ships, was shipping food from all over the world, uh, and literally kept millions of people from starving uh, during the war. Um, he also kind of got a lot of attention for organizing this big relief effort after a really terrible flood in Mississippi during uh, the Coolidge administration. And so he was this kind of great engineer, uh, really capable guy. And his uh, terrible misfortune um, as a politician was to be elected right before the greatest economic disaster that ever has, has occurred in world history, the Great Depression, which began in his first year in office. Um, Hoover was not, was not equal to this task. He tried to, to have the government help out, but... Um, uh, without without really any success, uh, and he just got the blame for this economic calamity. The um, uh, places where, where people were putting up tents because they were homeless got called Hoovervilles, um, and uh, during his re-election campaign, his opponent, Franklin Roosevelt, um, uh, tarred him as he only cares about the wealthy, he's not doing anything to help all the people that are struggling, um, and Hoover got crushed just as decisively in 1932 uh, as he had uh, been elected in, in 1928. Um, Hoover hated Roosevelt for the rest of his life. Uh, famously, when they, when they uh, rode together in the car to the inauguration, Hoover refused to talk to Roosevelt, um, really uh, um, never, never forgave him. Uh, but Things turned out okay for Hoover. One, he had made a, a fortune uh, running mining operations around the world before he had become president. Um, and he stayed involved in, in politics. He was uh, on various presidential commissions and, and, um, uh, and so on, particularly after uh, the Second World War. Um, and so despite his, his kind of uh, tragic mis misfortune politically, things, things turned out all right for him. All right, that's our presidents. And so for our examples, um, yeah, let's do this on the board. So if we have a graph, and I'll do this as uh, trees, uh, not because these graph traversals only work on trees, but it's sort of easy to see the meaning of depth first and breadth search when we're, when we're dealing with a tree. So here we have a tree A, B, D, E, and over here, C, F, G, and H. And so our kind of depth first search, where our pending is a, is a stack, uh, we can think of our pending um, here and our uh, output all right uh, down here. And so we start with A being pushed on to our, our 
our stack and we mark it as visited. So it's sort of the first thing that, that shows up. And uh, then we uh, uh, go through the, the neighbors of A, kind of B and C. So we've popped A off of our stack, push B on, and push C on. We have visited A. Next, we kind of go back to the start of our while loop, pop something off of our stack. So C popped off here. Uh, and then we process the neighbors of C, pushing them onto the stack. So we push F on, go back to the top of our while loop, pop topping off of our stack. That's F. Process its neighbors, push G on, push H on. Those get popped off H and then G. They don't have any children. And then at this point, you can see that our depth first search has kind of gone all the way down one side of the tree and then is kind of getting back to the, the final thing in our stack, which is going to lead it down the other side. So that's where this idea of depth first comes in, that by using this last in, first out structure, we end up going down kind of deep in one part of the tree and then coming back and, and going down a different part. So we pop off B, put on, push on D and E, and then those would be the last two that we would output. Does that make sense? Questions on our depth first search? So to do a breadth first example, won't go through uh, the whole thing, but just so that we get an idea. We have our Q pending. We put in A. And when we remove A from the Q and output it, we put in B and then C. And since kind of first in, first out, we'd remove B put in D and E, then remove and output C, push, uh, uh, add F to the Q, um, then we'd output D, output E, output F, and then we put G and H into the Q and output those. Does anyone kind of recognize uh, uh, our breadth first search does it match one of our, our traversals, our tree traversals? Yeah, which one? Jake? Yeah, our, our kind of breadth first search from the start kind of went through everything one away from our start node, then everything two away from our start node, then everything three away, then everything four away. So it's sort of from the start, it's breadth first. It's kind of going through all nodes that are uh, kind of certain distance away before going to the next set of nodes that are certain distance away. And that's when we're dealing with a tree, that's what our, our level order traversal does as well. Questions on that? Jeffrey. So how did depth first search works? Is that add the overall root and would output everything on one side of the show that it's a binary search root and then um, yes, so our, our depth first search would um, kind of go as far as it could in some direction and then sort of come back uh, and kind of continue from, kind of backtrack from a dead end and then continue from the next place that there was a node to go to. It's sort of a, a way to think about it logically. Um, other questions? All right, let's do a bit of practice with these ideas. 
So first, I have a graph here. Uh, would this graph be better described as dense or sparse? Moving towards sparse, excellent. Uh, who can tell us why this graph would better be described as sparse? Liam? Um, the number of edges is approximately equal to the number of vertices. Yeah, exactly. That we count the number of edges, there are eight of them, there are seven vertices. So that's close to the minimum edges we could have for a connected graph. Uh, so that's a good sign that it's it's sparse. Um, any questions on that? Let's practice some searching. So my start node is going to be zero. And let's say that I output nodes in the order 1, 0, 1, 3, 4, 5, 6, 2. Uh, would this be consistent with a breadth-first search, a depth-first search, both kinds of search, or neither kind of search? Uh, maybe a few more votes for depth-first search. Uh, that's uh, correct in this case. Um, why... Uh, why would this not be consistent with a breadth first search? Ron? Because it goes down kind of one, like it follows one path for basically as long as it can before going all the way back and then going down the other one. Exactly. That in breadth first, kind of, we should see all nodes that are the same distance away before we see any nodes that are farther away. And we can sort of see that this one went 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 before coming back to 2. Sir? If you were to do like a breadth of search, would 6 have to be connected to 2? I mean, to, would 6 have to be connected to the 0 for breadth of search? Uh, what do you mean by would it have to be connected? Because I guess. Oh, oh, you mean for this to be a valid breadth first search? Um, well, for this to be a valid breadth search, search, two would need to be the farthest thing away from zero because we see it last. So it would have to be farther away from zero than any of these other ones. So we need to, to change a lot about the graph to make that happen. Other questions? Marcus. Um, uh, say which edges again? Um, the the one between one and two and three and four. Where like do they even matter? Ah, uh, so um, for our search. Uh, we would pro we would process them because like we we would get to um, like at uh, at zero for our depth search search we push one and two onto our onto our stack two must have gone first because one gets popped off uh, and then when we process the neighbors of one we process three and two and zero. But for in the case of two and zero, we've already marked them as visited. So we don't add them back into our stack. So indeed, uh, this traversal will process every single edge, but will ignore a lot of them if they connect to, to nodes we've already visited. Does that make sense? Other questions? Um, does it really matter between, I mean, one and two, let's say, if it was zero, two, four, five, six, and then one, three, it would still be a depth first search, right? That's right. So does it matter if you go to one or to two first, or is there a way to sort of output the one that has the most, um, that has the highest depth? Uh, so there's kind of two questions in that. Uh, the more basic thing is when we, I didn't tell you anything about which order we go through the neighbors. And so the order that we go through the neighbors is going to determine kind of which nodes we actually get to first. Uh, the questions on the quiz that are about search say that we always process the neighbors in ascending order of their number. So if this were a question on the quiz, we 
process one before two. Uh, and if we're talking about neighbors of four, we'd process two and then three and then five. So that's one way that you could do it. You would just say like there's some particular order when we go through neighbors that that um, is there. Um, but for any for a graph in general, there's kind of it's arbitrary what order the neighbors come in. There's there, there's no set order, which just means that there are many possible outputs which would be consistent with a depth first search, kind of depending on which order nodes get get added to the um, uh, to the, the set of pending nodes. Does that make sense? All right, let's look at another one of these. Start node of zero with the following output. Zero, three, four, five, six, one, two. What would that be consistent with? Uh, I, the majority has the right idea here. This is not going to be consistent with either of our, our searches. Uh, can someone explain why you, how you, how you decided that it was neither breadth first or depth first? Anyone? Either way, the number after zero would have been one or two, and it's not. So exactly, that we start at zero, and no matter what structure we're using for pending, we're kind of going kind of from one node to its neighbors. So uh, neither of these searches could skip from from zero to three. Make sense? Last one. What kind of search, if any, might give us 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6? Uh, again, our, our majority has the right idea. This would be uh, a breadth first search. Uh, someone share how you thought about why it would be breadth first? Charlie? Um, it goes through all the nodes at each depth before moving lower. Exactly. We see everything that's one away from the start, and then two away, and then three away, and then four away. And that's what we expect, would expect from our, our breadth first search. Does that make sense? Any questions? Yeah. How can it be, can it be both, like, at first, other than it being, like, one node? Um, That's, uh, yeah, I, I, so I believe that you could construct a graph where the two would be the same. Um, for example, a long chain of, of notes. The depth first and breadth search will be the same. I think on this graph, uh, I'm not sure you could ever have an order that would work as both. Uh, like you could see 0, 1, 2, but then if it's depth first, you'd have to see 4 next. Or if you saw a zero one three, then you'd have to see you could never see zero one two, and then get to something that you didn't have an edge between if it was depth first. Ron, uh, is there anything like stopping it from going like zero two one four three and so on? Uh, In order of left to right node. No, that would again come down to kind of what order we loop through the neighbors um, and. It would it would be a perfectly good breadth for search if we ended up kind of putting two into the queue before one and then four into the queue before three, uh, so that yeah we would see zero two one four three. Other questions? All right, so let's make this uh, a little more. Or, or let's talk about some uh, a situation where a breadth first search uh, might give us some some useful useful information. So let's say that our graph uh, corresponds to some Midwest cities. We have St. Paul and Des Moines. And Chicago, uh, 
uh, and Milwaukee. And Columbus. And swear this is a real place. Crooksville. And I want to know what, uh, uh, how should I, if I'm kind of, in, in, if my start is St. Paul and my destination is Crooksville, like what route should I take to get from where I am to where I want to go? Um, and this is a case where our breadth first search could actually give us an answer to this. Uh, because let's imagine that I'm keeping track of how far away from the start certain nodes are uh, and how to get from nodes to the start. So start I have, it's zero away. Uh, and then which, oh, I forgot an edge here. You can't actually get from Chicago to Milwaukee. Um, Using a breadth first search, which nodes would I uh, would I go through next if I'm starting in St. Paul? Serving Des Moines, Chicago, Milwaukee. Yeah, I would. I might visit Des Moines uh, and say that's kind of one away, and then. Visit Chicago, which is also one away, and Milwaukee, which is also one away. Um, and what city would I visit next in my graph? Liam? Columbus. Uh, Columbus, that would be two away. And what would be next, Ben? And uh, Yes, and Cooksville, that would be three away. So my breadth for search. So far, I've used it to figure out kind of how far away from the start each node in the graph is based on just sort of when I visited them in the breadth first search. And if at the time that I visit a node, I also record the edge that brought me to that node. So in this case, when I visited Des Moines, I got there from St. Paul, same with Chicago, same with Milwaukee. And then let's say I got to Columbus by going through the neighbors of Des Moines, since that was the first one that I, I visited. And so I got to Columbus from Des Moines and then got to Cooksville from Columbus. And so now I have not only figured out how far away everything is, but also figured out how the shortest path, the kind of fewest number of edges to get from uh, my start to every other node in the graph. Where if I want to get from the start to Cooksville, that would be Columbus and Des Moines on the way. Chicago, I can get there directly. And Milwaukee, I can get there directly. So this, our breadth first search algorithm can kind of give us all this information about the graph. Uh, and this is very useful for um, figuring out a driving route, for figuring out flight itineraries, or how to send information uh, around the internet, or kind of what parts of a project you need to do first, because later parts depend on them. Um, and this is a case where breadth first uh, can do, give us uh, uh, a correct answer where depth first would not. Does anyone see how if we had done depth first search starting in St. Paul, it could give us the wrong information about the shortest path uh, to Crooksville? Peter? It could have gone from like St. Paul to Des Moines to Chicago to Milwaukee to Columbus to Crooksville. Exactly. That our, our depth first search uh, could kind of have taken the long way 
uh, to end up at the node furthest away, whereas our breadth first search will get there in sort of the fewest edges possible because it looks at everything that's one away, then everything that's two away, then everything that's three away. Does that make sense? And there, uh, these red arrows are getting at this sort of uh, nice uh, uh, technique to keep track of the paths that we're finding uh, on the breadth first search. Um, namely that uh, for any particular node, we don't need to, we don't need to record the entire path uh, to get there. We just need to record the previous node on the path. So for Crooksville, if we record that we got there from Columbus, and then for Columbus, we record that we got there from Des Moines, and then for Des Moines, we record that we got there from St. Paul, we can, record, we can reconstruct this entire shortest path. Uh, and this is typically how this sort of breadth first search uh, would be implemented. There is, however, a case where even the mighty breadth first search will fail. And that's when we start adding weights to our edges. So if I have a weighted graph, like this, which path would my breadth first search tell me is the shortest one to get from start to destination? Brian? Yeah, it would search everything one distance away uh, and say, look, this is your shortest path. It's one edge. But we can see that even going along these four edges up here, if we add up all the weights on the edges, we would say this is a total of 400, whereas this edge takes us 500. And similarly, if we added, say, actual distances to all these edges on my map here, uh, it might not be the case that we would get to Crooksville via Des Moines and Columbus. It might not actually be the fastest way. So. Our breadth first search can find shortest paths on unweighted graphs, but we're going to need something, uh, uh, something better uh, for weighted graphs, or rather something that can, that can account for uh, some edges uh, might, be, might be more efficient than others. Questions on that? All right, that's all I have for you today. On Friday, we'll uh, talk about both what are data structures that we would actually use to represent a graph, and then uh, what's an algorithm that can solve, that can find shortest paths on a weighted graph. Uh, the, as I said, quiz on Moodle due Friday, uh, Katie Tree uh, due tonight. I have office hours tomorrow evening in the lab, and I'll see you Friday.